I'm Brian Dickinson, and this training bite is on the basics of system Verilog classes. So this is the first in a series of training bites showing you how to use classes in system Verilog. And in this first one, we'll concentrate on the basic properties, methods, and constructors of a class. So, a class is a user-defined data type, and you must declare a class inside of a module, or a package, or an interface in System Verilog. You cannot compile a class standalone. So the class declarations can contain data items and also tasks and functions which operate on those data items. And during the course of a simulation, we can dynamically create and destroy our class objects. So they are dynamic, they are not static. So we use classes in System Verilog for test benches and simulation models, and System Verilog supports all the standard object-oriented features, such as abstraction, inheritance, encapsulation, and polymorphism. And we'll look at all of these in the course of this series of training bytes. So once we have our class declaration, we can declare a variable of the class type, and this is called the class handle. And the uninitialized value of a class handle is null, N-U-L-L. -L, and you can test for this with a conditional statement if you want. Now obviously to use the variable, we need to create a class instance for that handle. And we do that by calling the constructor of the class. This is a function called new. So you make a procedural call to the function new. And this creates an instance of the class in memory. And it returns a pointer to that instance and stores it in the handle of your class. So you can also declare and create the class instance in one line by calling the new in line with the handle declaration. And this may be convenient to avoid forgetting to make the class instance before you use it. Now that class instance persists until it's no longer in use, but the good news is it's not your responsibility to keep track on if the class instance is being used or not. So there's no such thing as a deconstructor in System Verilog. You construct your instances and the simulator keeps track of the use of those instances. And when a simulator sees that an instance is no longer being used, it can recycle the instance. So System Verilog uses automatic garbage collection. So it's more Java-like than C++. So this makes our coding of System Verilog classes a lot easier because we don't have to deal with deconstruction explicitly. So let's talk a little bit about terminology. So your class type declaration declares class members. And these include data items, what we call the properties or the fields of the class, and also tasks and functions, which we call the methods of the class. So you access the class methods from a class instance using the dot notation. So in my direct access here, I create an instance C1 of my class. I can then access the number property of C1 by using the dot notation, C1.number, and I can read and write to that property. If I have methods declared to access the property, I can also use those methods. So in a second example, method access, I'm calling the set method of the C2 instance of my class to assign number to be equal to three. And I call the get method to retrieve the value of number for the dollar display line. So by default in System Verilog, you've got full and unrestricted access to all the class members, all the properties and all the methods of your class. Now, uh, let's have a look at the extern declaration for classes. So for convenience, for readability, you can declare a class method outside of the class declaration. And to do this, we declare the prototype of the method, and then we prefix the prototype with the extern keyword. And the prototype is basically the first line of the method. It identifies whether it's a task or a function, it tells us the name, and it also tells us the type and the number of arguments that we have. Now, once you've declared it as an extern, you must obviously fully provide an implementation of that method, and we can do this outside the class declaration, but obviously in the same scope. And the implementation obviously must match the prototype that you declared with the extern keyword, and we link our implementation to the extern declaration by using the name of the class, in this example here, my class, 
and then the double colon operator this is the scope resolution operator so function my class colon colon get is the implementation of the extern class method declared in my class so the reason why we do this is for readability by declaring all your class methods using externs it allows the user to quickly and easily see what methods are allowed for a particular class without having to wade through pages of implementation so it has no effect on the simulation it's just a readability hack so let's have a closer look at the constructor of a class now. So the method new is a special class method and we call this the constructor and we have this defined by default for all of our classes. So in our first example here, DEFCON, we call the constructor of the class to create the class instance and when we do that, number will have an initial value according to its data type. It's an int, which is a two-state type, so c1.number will have a starting value of zero. Now, you may want to initialize the property for a particular uh, instance of your class. So what we could do is we could explicitly define the constructor to initialize our class property. So when we do this, the class function new looks like any other class function, except it does not have a return type. It's not even allowed to have a void value there as the return type. So the constructor of a class is called new. It's a function. It does not have a return type. Here in the class epscon, we're using this to hardwire the value of number to be a starting value of 5. If we wanted to, we could pass in arguments to that constructor. So in our class example argcon here, I have an argument to the constructor ai of type int, which means that every time I call a constructor, I must now pass in a value. And here I'm using it to set the initial value of the number property of the C3 instance of argcon to be equal to 3. And you could also use a default value if you wanted for that argument. So, hey, we now know enough about classes to build uh, our first class. So this is a class called Frame. It has address, payload, and parity properties. Uh, the address and the payload properties are set by the constructor. So we pass in two arguments, ADD and DAT, which we use to assign to our properties. And the constructor also calls another method of the class, uh, GenPar, which is used to update the parity property of the class. So now once you've constructed it and passed in values for the address and payload, then the parity should be up to date with those values you pass in the, into the constructor. We've also got another method here, getFrame, and this is what we call a packing method. So what it does is it returns all the properties of the class concatenated together into one large vector, here a 14-bit vector. So that's simple class operation to start off with. We looked at the basic features in this training byte. Uh, in the next training byte, we'll have a look at static members, static methods, and static properties. And further bytes in this series, we'll have a look at aggregation, inheritance, polymorphism, virtual methods, and randomization.